Hey everybody, welcome to the All Analytics Facebook video chat. My name is Michael Steinhardt, I'll be your moderator this afternoon. And we've got a great topic today, do's and don'ts of data visualization. Uh, joining us are Beth Schultz, who's the Editor-in-Chief of All Analytics, and Jonathan Schwabish, who's an economist with the U.S. government. But let me first, before I tell you a little bit about our guests, let me explain the format that we're running here. Uh, we're live, we're chatting with you via video and via chat room. Right beneath the video window you'll see two tabs, there's social stream and chat. You want to click on chat, you can talk to us, you can send in questions. Uh, we're going to address some of them on the air, as many as we can. Uh, but just in case we can't, we will actually, after 30 minutes of broadcast, we will join you in the chat room to continue the conversation. So don't go away. Uh, stay multimodal, send in your questions, and we're about to get started. Let me just quickly explain that if you're, if you're a fan of all analytics, which I imagine you are, uh, you already know Beth. Uh, if you're new, let me just tell you that she's an award-winning IT journalist. Uh, she's a business expert, and she's got more than two decades of experience covering the industry. Um, and a little bit more about Jonathan Schwabish, who is a federal economist and creator of policy-relevant data visualizations. So Jonathan holds a PhD in economics from Syracuse University. He earned his undergraduate degree also in economics at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, now he's conducted a lot of research on inequality, immigration, retirement security, food stamps, and other issues related to public policy in the United States. Uh, his work has been published in such venues as the Journal of Human Resources and the National Tax Journal. And you can see samples of his visualization work um, on visualizing.org and visual.ly. And you can learn more about Jonathan and his workshop series on visual analytics. Um, and the site URL for that is policyviz.com, policyviz.com. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn the conversation over to Beth and Jonathan. Welcome. Let's get started. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And hello, John. How are you doing? Good, Beth. How are you? Okay. I'll also throw in one more little point here. Uh, John is also an all analytics, uh, all analytics blogger, so uh, watch out for his words of wisdom on our site as well. Now, John, before we get started, um, with the do's and don'ts, why don't you tell us a little bit, bit about, you know, first, what got you interested in data, data visualization, and then second, what got you interested in helping others create effective visualizations? Sure. So my first sort of introduction to data visualization, I took a course, a one-day course uh, by uh, Edward Tufte. If, for those of you who haven't heard of Edward Tufte, I sort of view him as the godfather of modern data visualization. So he has this one-day workshop. And I took the workshop and it really was sort of an eye-opener to how we can use graphics and data visualization in a more strategic way and a way in which we can show our data in clearer and sort of more innovative ways. So I took the course and, and got back to my office and being an economist uh, and, a, and a policy analyst, you know, I create a lot of graphs and a lot of charts all the time, and so it was easy to sort of think about putting uh, the things that I had learned through the Tufty course and his books and then sort of moving to the online uh, community of data visualization, put those things into practice and to keep practicing and thinking about we, different ways and better ways in which we can present our data. And I'll talk about some of the sort of fundamental strategies I use in a little bit. But as I thought about ways in which we can communicate through our, our analysis through data visualization, I looked around at my colleagues and my coworkers and other economists in the field and saw the types of work that they were doing. And so I started looking more carefully at the sort of work that other people were doing and how could we do a better job of communicating through data visualization and, and using graphics in general. And so from there, it just sort of, it sort of took off. There's a very active um, I'd say welcoming community out there of people who are doing data visualization. Um, there's a lot of great authors and a lot of people willing to provide advice and help. So it was um, really just the one step of uh, getting introduced to the field and then sort of diving right in and, and thinking harder about how I want to present my results of my research and my analysis in new and different ways. 
Well, John, I think that you're probably pretty fortunate to have uh, have had the opportunity to attend a, a seminar by Edward. Uh, Tufty, I think that a lot of people would probably in our audience might be a little bit jealous of that because he is, as you said, the godfather of modern visualization. Um, uh, so when you taught, you just talked about sort of finding an active and welcoming community doing data visualization. Now, do you mean within the government sector itself or just sort of broader, more broadly um, in terms of interest in data visualization? No, I mean more broadly. So um, there's a small but growing group of people in um, the federal government, at least, that are doing data visualization. Um, I know a few people in state and local governments who are trying to do uh, similar work. Um, but there, I, I, I'm talking sort of more broadly about the data visualization field itself. So there are people like um, Nathan Yao at flowingdata.com, uh, Andy Kirk at visualizingdata.com, um, Alberto Cairo, who just wrote a book called The Functional Art. Um, I can go on and on with the number of people who are doing this sort of work, who are uh, conducting workshops, um, writing books, writing blog posts, all of which are trying to help people think more strategically about better ways that they can present their data in a more sort of visually appealing and, um, and uh, uh, more uh, visually sort of accurate uh, form. So obviously data visualization has been a very hot topic um, we've seen this year at least. And I'm always kind of curious, so if, as a data visualizer, how much time do you sort of think about as you're creating your data visualization, how much time do you have to convey your information to the audience? Is it something that they have to get right away or can they take some time to study that visualization and come away with the insight that you want them to have? So I think, so it's a good question and I think I think it's important to sort of lay out the different types of visualizations that are out there. So there's um, static uh, data visualizations, which is generally the sort of thing that I do. Um, and then there's uh, interactive visualizations. Um, so those are the sorts of things that you might see on the New York Times website or the Washington Post website or any other sort of place where you can sort of dig around and play with the data. Now interactive visualizations um, have sort of, uh, uh, I would view them in two branches. They're sort of an exploratory type of, of interactive visualization where you're encouraged to go into the data, play around, come up with different stories, maybe, maybe uh, reach your own conclusions with the data. And then there's an explanatory graphic where the author is sort of leading you down a path, telling you a story, and your interactivity is leading you down that path. On the static side, they tend to be more explanatory because you, the, 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 um, the user doesn't have the uh, capabilities to sort of work with the data or play with the graphics. So in terms of creating a static visualization um, in which you're really trying to tell a particular story, um, I find that once I actually have that story in mind, once I have figured out what exactly I want to say, I spend a lot of my time actually sketching out the graphic itself. And I should also say that there's a subtlety within the static world too. So um, probably a lot of people who are listening right now make lots of graphs during their day. They make lots of bar charts or line charts or column charts. And those sort of one single charts that maybe are part of a report, that's one type of visualization, static visualization. And then there are the bigger infographics that are sort of the big a hot thing right now, sort of these towers of, of graphics and text and images. You know, those are sort of two different um, products. On the infographic side, I spend a lot of time sketching and thinking about actually how to lay it out, how to tell the story. And I'd say I spend probably 70 to 80 percent of my time thinking about that particular point of the graphic. And once I figured out that story, and this is sort of, I'm in an analog world here, right? I'm actually sketching with pen and paper and colored pencils. Once I have that laid out, then I can move, I can create my graphics and move them into the layout software. Things like Adobe Illustrator or Inkscape or Adobe InDesign. Um, but the data visualization is also relevant for things if you're making a standard bar chart or a standard column chart. There are things that you can do to make those graphics clearer um, make them sharper or make them uh, make it easier for your audience to gain insight. So if you are new to the world of data visualization, don't think that it's just about 
creating complex static or complex interactive graphics. It really can start at the at the basic level of making the standard chart that you've always made. So, so John, you said that you mostly create static visualizations. And is that because of the type of data you're working with or the audience that you have? And I would imagine understanding that is, is pretty critical in knowing what kind of data visualization you should create. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, so I uh, work for the U.S. government, and, and my, my, uh, my audience tends to be members of Congress. And so most of the um, graphics I make are static because I'm trying to provide members of Congress and their staffs with sort of the bottom line uh, statistic or story, the headline piece of information. And at this point, I'm not sure that my audience is really interested in an interactive graphic where they have to sort of weave and explore and click. That's not my audience. Um, so it, it, it absolutely, uh, the type of graphic you're making is absolutely determined by your audience and how you think they will use the graphics and the visualizations that you're making. So what are the hallmarks of a great visualization, whether it's static or uh, more interactive? That, that's a great question. That's a, that's a hard question. I think regardless of the type of visualization I've talked about, so static, be it an infographic, be it a static chart within some bigger report, be it an interactive graphic, be it an animated graphic, might be a movie, I think the key thing is that a visualization should allow the reader to gain some insight that they may not have had prior to, to getting to, to looking at that visualization. If you can give your reader insight that they may not have gotten from some other means, be the written report, be it some other be some other website or some other source, that I think is a successful visualization. Now, of course, there's once you get into this world of creating a visualization there are things like color and font and layout that can, um, you know, that are sort of the line between a good infographic versus a great infographic. Um, but I think at the end of the day, uh, great visualizations are ones that um, give the reader insight that they may not have had before. So let's look at the, the converse to that then. What makes a bad visualization? And beyond that, um, you know, what, what's at risk if you send out a bad visualization? So I think the worst visualization is a type of visualization that distorts the data um, in a way that either tells a biased story or, or, or tells a story in a, in, a, in a false way. Now, of course, there are people who's, who have particular leanings, but I think a visualization that's aimed to uh, provide insight but distorts the data in a way is really where you run into trouble. I don't imagine you find much of that in the government, do you? Uh, not, not where I work. Um, there, are, <laughs> um, there are lots of people out there who, you know, they obviously, you know, people in, being in government, being in business, being in, in, in policy or whatever, they have particular uh, viewpoints. And so, you know, you can easily create a visualization that tells your uh, particular side of the story. Um, but I think a bad visualization will um, not be true to the data and that's probably that really probably has nothing to do with the visualization itself that has more to do with the analysis when it comes to the actual uh, visualization in terms of what you put on the graph I think things that um, obscure the data um, things like thick grid lines and tick marks and um, you know sort of icons or pictures that that either distort or obscure the data are those visualizations where I think they, they, um, they lose their focus and they don't do the job they're supposed to be doing. Okay, so you do a lot of training, you, do, you produce a lot of um, visualizations. What do you, I'm kind of curious, personally, what do you see more of, good visualizations or bad visualizations? Oh, that's a good question. I think generally, um, I think I usually see uh, bad visualizations um, because people don't know or are not familiar with um, the good strategies, the good techniques that they can use to make uh, good visualizations. Um, and that extends both to uh, not just making, you know, your standard sort of line chart or bar chart, but being familiar with uh, not newer, but more popular types of visualizations that are now out there. For example, a few years ago, you never would have seen a scatter plot in the New York Times. And now you see them regularly. Uh, you'll start to see charts called dot plots and slope charts and bump charts more and more often now. 
as we become more familiar as, as sort of our literacy about these types of graph types uh, become more common. So the types of graphics we're going to start seeing will we'll kind of grow large, you know, we'll, we'll see more types. But does that also sort of bring up the situation where we might see more misuse of visualizations as people try to start, as data visualizers try to play around with new types of visualizations that maybe they don't really understand or how, yeah. how to use effectively? Yeah, I think whenever you start to introduce new forms of, I mean, it's really new form of design, right? Whenever you sort of introduce new forms, there's a, there's a process that will, that there's a give and take between the, the creator of the visualization and the audience. And there's a literacy that will build and it'll take some time. Um, there are even newer types of visualizations that I don't even think have names yet that are sort of popping up on infographics um, on the various uh, showcase sites like visualizing.org and visually. Um, and there, it'll be a process, but I think what it'll take is more and more experience with these different types of, of graphics and more people using them. And as people become more familiar and more experienced with them, I think the quality will ultimately go up. So John, I know that you have three fundamental principles for data visualization. Why don't you share what those are and then tell us how easy or difficult they are to, to learn and to put into practice. Sure. So I tend to follow three sort of fundamental principles when I think about data visualization. And, um, you know, there are no really hard and fast rules, but the three things I think about are to show the data. You see there on the slide. Uh, show the data, which is the most important thing. That's why people are looking at your graphic, people are reading your report, people are visiting your website. They want to see the data. They want to see the story. The second principle is to reduce chart junk. And chart junk is a term that was coined by Edward Tufte. And it refers to all those things that are not data or distort data. Um, things like 3D, uh, three dimensions in, in graphs that don't have a third dimension. Things like tick marks and grid lines and icons and pictures that are just sort of window dressing but are sort of violating the first principle which is to show the data. And the final principle is to try to integrate graphics and text. And sort of the simplest way to think about that is to think about creating your own graph that has a legend. And if you say for example if you're an Excel user and you create a, uh, a, a line chart in Excel, it'll throw a legend off and to the right and to the side there. Well, that's sort of disconnected from the graphic itself. And so the other principle I tried to follow is to integrate text and the graphics themselves. And so the simplest place is to remove legends and to move those labels onto the graphics. So if you're a New York Times, Washington Post reader, any of these sort of news sites that are doing more visualizations, you'll see that their graphics are all annotated, that the text is moved directly onto the graphic itself so that as the reader, you can get the entire story from the graphic and that the text and the article sort of will, will expand on that. So I think I sort of want to uh, show an example of what I think is sort of a bad visualization that violates some of these principles. Um, so this is the second slide, Matt, if you can put up. So this is a graphic from a um, economics journal. And this is a four panel chart and what, they're, what the authors are doing are plotting out coefficient estimates from four separate regression models. And so what you can see here is from the four models they're plotting out, and they're violating probably the most important principle, which is to show the data. So if you look at this chart, the thickest line on all four of these charts is that x-axis, that 0% line. When the most important thing on this graph is the uh, dark line that's you know moving up or moving down in each of these four charts. So when you look at this graph, your eyes immediately drawn to the axis line and not to the data. Um, another part is that the tick marks on each of the x-axis are probably unnecessary. These graphs are aligned vertically and horizontally. So there's a lot of extra stuff on here that's probably not necessary. Things like the redundancy in all of the y-axis labels, there are percentage, uh, there's the, uh, the axis line uh, arrow. Um, again, on the percentage signs, you have percentage signs on all of these y-axis labels, but you also have a y-axis um, 
uh, title there as well. And there's four of them when, again, these graphs are all aligned vertically and horizontally. Um, you also have these four acronyms. You can see the caseload colon AO at the top left there. Um, you don't really know what that stands for, and this is pretty common in, in, especially in the economics literature, you see these acronyms are sitting all over the place. Well, in this particular journal, you'd have to flip three pages prior to this graph to figure out what these mean. And then finally, if you look carefully, you can see on the bottom two charts. Um, Matt, if you can skip ahead for me to the second to last chart slide I sent. General, he's flipping ahead. Let me yeah. ask you this. Is, is, are these, do you think, obviously you do or do not know who created these, but is it because the person didn't understand how to use the tool that they were using to create the, the um, visualization or they just didn't think hard enough about what it is that they were actually presenting? I mean, where do you think the fault most, most typically lies in this sort of issue? In my experience, it's mostly because people haven't thought carefully about the graphics. In my experience as an economist, um, there's not a lot of training in, um, in data visualization in graduate programs. So that's one place where people aren't sort of taught to think about it. And the other things that economists tend to do, and I'm sure it's similar in lots of fields, is people work with their data, they create a model, they estimate that model, and then they write up the text around it. And the tables and the figures are sort of there as convenience, as a sort of thing, oh, I, I should have this. But it's not thinking strategically about the visual, about visualizing the data, which is what that sort of, um, what, I, what I took out of that Tufti course, which is to think strategically about the data. So, so go ahead. I'm sorry, so they're looking to break up the page of a report versus delivering information through the infographic. I mean, they're not trying, they're not thinking strategically about the best ways to present the data graphically. Okay. Um, and so if you look at the, the chart that, um, that was up, it has a lot of extra stuff on it. And so what I'd like to show if I can on the last slide is a suggested redesign of these four charts. If we can bring that up, I'll show you exactly what I mean by bringing these uh, three principles together. So you can see here what I did was I reduced all the chart junk. So I got rid of a lot of the excess labels and percentage signs. I lightened all of the grid lines and made the darkest line the data line. So that's showing the data. I did make that zero axis line grid line a little bit darker because it serves as a base. And then I spelled out these titles for each of these four charts. I integrated the text <clears throat> that in this particular article was left as its own sort of table earlier in the, in, the, in the article. I integrated it right directly into the chart itself. And it doesn't take up a lot more room, and it's right there. And so now you get the whole picture directly from this chart. And of course, there's a lot of decisions I made here that others might decide differently. You might want to have all the y-axis numbers on all four charts, or you might want to have the x-axis labels in all four charts. Some of this is a little bit of art, some of this is a little bit of science. And over time, as you create your own visualizations and come up with your own principles and your own guidelines, you'll figure out what works for you and your audience. Well, I know I certainly found your, uh, your versions a lot easier to absorb than the other ones, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so, so John, how you know how easy is it to fix those data visualizations once you see some bad ones? Um, if folks follow your basic principles, can anybody do this? Do you think? Yeah. So again, I I, I want to make sure we distinguish between making a chart like the one I just showed versus making a, an infographic that you might see on some of the showcase sites we mentioned versus making an interactive uh, graphic. So an interactive graphic, for example, you might need uh, training or experience in HTML or JavaScript or those sorts of programming languages. To make a full-blown uh, tower infographic, you may need experience or some sort of training in a design software like Adobe Illustrator or certainly experience in a program like Inkscape. But I think to create good visualizations that show the data that um, follow those principles, I don't think they require any uh, specific training. I think it's sort of like learning a language. 
Um, we all have the ability to learn French or Spanish or any sort of language, but it just takes some practice and some training to do so. So if you're the type of person, if, if you're out there listening and you have familiarity with statistics and data management, I think that's the biggest hurdle because once you understand how data works, once you understand how to present data in a clear way, then the visualizing, then, then, then visualizing that data, I think you just follow some basic principles. It's like learning the nouns and the verbs in a particular language. And once you learn that, um, you'll be able to show your, uh, your graphics in a, in, a, uh, in a clearer way. I would imagine it would probably help to sort of put the visualization aside, go do some other stuff, maybe go, you know, come back the next day and look at it again and get a fresh perspective on it. Does, does that help? It's certainly a process. So, you know, I, I'd say, for example, when I make some of these longer infographics, um, I'll have pages and pages of sketches that will take a course of a few days and, and things will, uh, I'll change things over time as, you know, perhaps as I sketch out a chart and then I go see the data, I'll find it by making that chart, I'll have some insight into the data and go back again and start and start over and sort of re, re sketch. So it's certainly a process. And it's certainly um, a skill. I think it's a skill that, that, that can be learned. And as you're going through that sketching process, I'm curious, are you working with, is that, are you doing that by yourself? Or are you working with possibly the folks that might ultimately be receiving the results, uh, the insight through the visualization? Um, are you doing it as a, a, a team with other visual uh, designers? Um, how does that process work? Um, so it depends on the on the particular project. Um, I do work with a, I do work with a graphic designer um, who has training in graphic design and more experience in the sort of uh, tools and software products that that are needed to make infographics. Um, but importantly, if I'm making an infographic based on a longer report or analysis, I'll work closely with the authors of that report to make sure that I understand their bottom line, to make sure that I understand the in-depth analysis that they've done because all the infographic is doing is bubbling the most important pieces of information to the top. So I need to make sure that I understand the headline so that I can think about how to create the visual, the, the clear visualization. Um, so it is a process. It's, I think um, you see teams like at the New York times, for example, they have 30 or so people on their graphics teams. I think when you have a team of people who are, you know, who are interested, who have the skills, I think you only end up, um, you know, sort of uh, ending up with better graphics because you're you're working with people, you're bouncing ideas off each other, you're all sketching and working together. So the review, re reviewing those visualizations is obviously very important. Then part part of that whole process. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. There's a whole review process both on um, the content of the graphic. Um, and then also on the color of the graphic, for example, as, as one sort of graphic element we might review pretty carefully. So as an example, um, uh, you know, certain colors have certain meanings to people. Red and blue have certain particular connotations for people. Um, red and green, about 10% of people are colorblind and can't distinguish between red and green, so we're careful about that. Um, red often acts as a highlighting color, so you may have a graph with three lines uh, if you make one of those lines red, it ends up being a highlighted, it may appear to be a highlighted line when you may not actually mean it to be the case. So, you know, there's sort of the graphic review and fact checking process, and then there's a fact checking and the review on the, on the actual analytics. Important point. Michael, should we jump over to questions from the chat board? Sure. Um, got anything coming in there? We've got a couple of very good questions that have come in. Uh, we are sort of pushing up against the half hour mark. So let's take one on the air and then we'll address the rest in the chat room if that's all right. Uh, Good. So Jonathan, this is more specific to your work. Um, how does data visualization help explain complex economic concepts to non-economists? Do you have any quick examples of that? That's a good question. Um, so I think the way to do that is to you know, think about a particular audience. So I tend to think of my audience of reading my work as a educated person with some background in statistics. So that means I don't have to explain what a mean is every time or what the median is every time. Um, but things that you can do to boil down complex analysis can be pretty simple. So for example, 
one thing that I always uh, what I always struggle with is how to show uncertainty, which is a big challenge in economics literature. Sure. And so one thing you might see are um, uh, so what are called box plots, which if you imagine basically a, a rectangle with a line above and a line below shows a bunch of points of the distribution. Well, you can simplify that by stripping out some of those pieces of information so that you might have, let's say, uh, some estimate of the middle of the distribution and then two points around that that show maybe the confidence interval or two other points in the distribution. So oftentimes it's about simplifying information as opposed to showing more information. Um, another thing uh, I, I talk to people about is reducing the periodicity of their data. So you may have, say, the unemployment rate you're going to graph for 50 years. Is it important to show all of the months over all 50 years? Or can you reduce that down to quarters or to even years? As you do that, it smooths the pattern. If it doesn't change the pattern, then you're still on solid ground. But it smooths the pattern and may make it easier for people to understand uh, the exact point you're trying to make. Got it. So sometimes simplifying is definitely better than mm -hmm. throwing a lot more data points at the audience. Absolutely. All right. Well, this has been a tremendously valuable conversation. Uh, and Beth, John, if you don't mind, we're going to take it over to the, conf to the chat area right now. Directly below the video screen that you're looking at, you'll see two tabs social stream and chat. Click chat. I'm there. Beth is there. John will be there. And we'll continue the conversation. We still have a couple of questions in the queue, so please be patient. Continue the conversation and join us next time when we do this in the future. Uh, and for All Analytics, I'm Michael Steinhardt, and I want to thank Beth Schultz and John Schwabisch for joining us today. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, John. Thank you, Beth. See you all in the chat room.